welcome to the Complete History of Science, Series 3, Episode 6, The Scientist and the Philosopher. Abu Ali ibn Sina was not a humble man. Born to a Persian family in 980 AD, in his biography, he boasted that by the age of 10, he had memorized the entire Quran, which in his words, evoked a great deal of amazement. His father, a prosperous tax collector in the Samanid Empire, recognized the boy's talents and ensured that he received a good education. He found him a tutor, a man called Abu al-Natili, who introduced Ibn Sina to all of the most important Greek works, including Ptolemy's Almagest and Euclid's Elements. However, Ibn Sina claims he quickly surpassed his tutor, who took leave of him. Next, at the age of 16, he decided to study medicine, but in his own words, medicine is not one of the difficult sciences, and therefore I excelled in it in a very short time, to the point where distinguished physicians began to read medicine with me. Through his father's connections, he came to the attention of the Samanid Sultan, and at 17, he became the royal physician. But what seems to have delighted him most about this position was his access to the royal library. He found that the library contained books he had never heard of, and so he used the opportunity to read widely. Ibn Sina read law and mathematics, claiming characteristically to have become an expert in both. However, it was also here in the royal library that he would find philosophy, the subject which would become his lifelong passion. He wrote, The next year and a half I devoted myself entirely to reading philosophy. So I continued until all the philosophical sciences became deeply rooted in me and I understood them as much as is humanly possible. In this library, Ibn Sina found a wealth of philosophical writing but by far the greatest influence on him was Aristotle. Aristotle's writing had been translated into Arabic in Baghdad during the heyday of the translation movement two centuries earlier, and Islamic scholars immediately recognised their value. Al-Kindi, one of the most important philosophers of the period, wrote an introductory text on Aristotle, and his own philosophy drew heavily on the ancient Greek thinker. This would influence generations of philosophers, and up to the time of Ibn Sina, Islamic philosophy would become deeply involved with the work of Aristotle. However, it had been over a thousand years since Aristotle's death, and the world had changed considerably. Islamic philosophers faced the issue that not all of Aristotle's work was compatible with Islamic theology. The relationship between Aristotle and Islamic thought is best illustrated by considering the issue of creation. In Islam, the orthodox belief is that the universe was created from nothing by God at some point in the past, known as creatio ex nihilo. But Aristotle had written that the universe was infinite and had always existed. This issue was exactly the same one which had faced early Christian thinkers, and as it had there, it stimulated a range of responses. Al-Kindi was himself deeply religious, and adopted the orthodox belief rejecting Aristotle's eternal universe. But not all of the writers who followed him showed such concern. Al-Farabi was a philosopher, whose fame led him to gaining the epithet, the second teacher, after the first teacher, Aristotle. His adherence to Aristotle's philosophy was so strong that he risked heresy by rejecting creation. That wasn't to say that Al-Farabi was an atheist, but he believed that the Islamic message should be interpreted by philosophers rather than theologians. When Ibn Sina discovered Aristotle in the Royal Library then, he also inherited these same religious and philosophical concerns. Ibn Sina developed his own thoughts on the issue of creation, 
arguing that creation is an action which must exist outside of time, and therefore the universe can be both created and exist eternally. Another way of looking at this is that the universe is eternal, but it's continually being brought into existence by God's will. Ibn Sinner's position on this issue was both subtle and clever, and it was this type of argument which made his philosophy famous. In making this argument, he was building on the foundation of Aristotle, while also harmonising his work with the particular religious and philosophical concerns of the time. This endeavour would become Ibn Sinner's life work, and he would be successful in creating a philosophical system which was internally coherent and, at least in his view, capable of answering most of the questions one would have around God, the universe, and being. Ibn Sina came to be regarded as the greatest philosopher of the age, and perhaps the greatest in all Islam. He gained a large following of students, who disseminated his work, and despite political upheavals, he was consistently able to find royal patronage among the various Islamic rulers of the region. However, the extent to which Ibn Sina contributed to the development of science is debatable. In addition to Aristotle, Ibn Sina was influenced by the Neoplatonists and other philosophers of late antiquity, and like them, he was primarily interested in metaphysics and ethics. Ibn Sina showed little enthusiasm for exploring everyday phenomena, and in his natural philosophy, his work was largely, if not wholly, derived from Aristotle. Nevertheless, what marks the Islamic Golden Age as significant is that there was a great diversity of thought. While Aristotle's metaphysics and natural philosophy were widely endorsed, there were alternatives. Some philosophers, such as Al-Razi, advocated for atomism, the other major strand of Greek natural philosophy. Others simply doubted the value of philosophy altogether. Skepticism towards Aristotle became a tradition in its own right, persisting throughout the period. And perhaps the greatest skeptic of all was a man known as Al-Biruni. Abu Rehan Al-Biruni was perhaps destined from a young age to clash with Ibn Sina. He was slightly older, born around 973 AD, in the outskirts of Karth, only a few hundred kilometres from where Ibn Sina grew up. In contrast to Ibn Sina, however, his early life is not well documented, and it's likely that he was born into much more humble circumstances. Nevertheless, he does seem to have received a good education in a broad range of subjects. Al-Biruni made good use of his education, because while he lived in an age where many men could be called polymaths, the breadth and depth of his understanding was still remarkable. For example, he had a gift for languages, and in addition to his native dialect, he learned Arabic, Persian, Greek, Syriac, Hebrew, and Sanskrit. Like Ibn Sina, Al-Biruni had a diverse set of interests, but while Ibn Sina claimed to have mastered most of the areas of learning known to the ancients, Al-Biruni frequently invented his own, he made use of his gift for languages, becoming one of the first anthropologists, and used his knowledge of Sanskrit to conduct a study of the people of the Indian subcontinent. He also wrote extensively on history, and made one of the first studies of comparative religion. But, unlike Ibn Sina, he was also keenly interested in the natural world. One of his achievements was that he made a careful study of the properties of various materials, measuring their specific gravities with a balance derived from Archimedes' principle. He was most productive in astronomy, where he wrote 39 separate treaties, and his gift for languages was especially useful, as it allowed Al-Biruni to access the Indian as well as the Greek tradition of astronomy. He learned from the Indian astronomer 
Aryabhata, about the idea that the daily motion of the celestial bodies could be explained by the rotation of the earth. He realised that this idea was incompatible with Ptolemy's argument that objects in free fall would not fall vertically if the earth had a rotational movement. However, he also expressed doubts that Ptolemy's argument was necessarily true. Alberuni's work was highly practical, and he authored one of the most important books on the construction of the astrolabe and a separate one on the sextant. He also used his astronomical knowledge to measure the coordinates of various cities, developing maps which were innovative and provided a more space-conscious representation of the world. The scope of Alberuni's work was immense, but what united it was a fixation on measurement and quantification. Famously, he used a new technique to determine the Earth's circumference. Alberuni had not been the first person during the Islamic Golden Age to become interested in measuring the Earth. Eratosthenes' work was well known, but many wondered how accurate his value of 40,000 kilometres actually was, and so they set out to verify it. The earliest attempt to do this was sponsored by Al Mamun, who, in 830 AD, appointed a group of astronomers to retake Eratosthenes' measurement using the same technique. Unfortunately, this method was problematic because it relied on knowing the distance between two distant points. Eratosthenes' solution had been to pay someone to walk the distance between Alexandria and Cyrene, some 800 kilometres. But this was a clear obstacle to an accurate measurement. Al-Biruni famously quipped that he could measure the earth without trundling through the desert. Al-Biruni's method instead only required taking measurements of a tall mountain. He found a suitable peak while he was travelling in Nandana in modern Pakistan. This was an ideal place to take the measurement, as the mountain stands high above the flat Punjab plains, which, from the top, allowed him to look out and sight the horizon. First, he needed to establish the height of the mountain, so he stood on the flat plains, some known distance away from the mountain top. He then measured the angle between the horizontal and the peak of the mountain. From this, he could form a simple geometrical model in the shape of a right angle triangle, with the length of the base is the distance to the top of the mountain, and the angle measured is the angle between the base and the hypotenuse. By the time of Alberuni, Trigonometry was very well developed, and it was trivial to use his measurements to calculate the height of the mountain. Next, Alberuni went to the top of the mountain, where he measured the angle to the horizon. Using this, together with knowledge of the height of the mountain, he was again able to construct another triangular geometrical model. This time, the radius of the Earth was the base and using the angle to the horizon and some slightly less trivial trigonometry, he could calculate the radius. Assuming the Earth was spherical, he then calculated the circumference and arrived at a value of around 40,000 kilometers, close to the previous estimate. Regrettably, it's impossible to know for certain how accurate this measurement is, owing to the uncertainty around the units used. Nevertheless, Alberuni's work demonstrates his adherence to observation and quantitative measurement, which he believed was the only path to acquiring knowledge about the natural world. This view led him to become deeply cynical about conclusions based on Aristotle's natural philosophy. Inevitably, this put him at odds with his contemporaries, and particularly the foremost advocate of Aristotle, Ibn Sina. We can't say for sure whether these men ever met, but 
they did carry out a lengthy correspondence, which fortunately for us, has mostly survived. These letters are amongst the most important scientific documents of the period, because they demonstrate the different worldviews of two of the most important thinkers of the period. Al-Biruni initiated the correspondence with his younger contemporary by setting Ibn Sina a series of 18 questions, asking him to explain a range of phenomena. The correspondence starts out civil, and Ibn Sina writes to Al-Biruni, May Allah surround you with all you wish for, and may he grant you all you hope for, and bestow on you the happiness in this life. In his response to Al-Biruni's questions, Ibn Sina takes his time to give a considered defence of his views. The questions posed were varied, and they touch on large cosmological questions, once again debating the issue of creation of the universe. However, they also touched on questions which were less well explored, and they debated the reasons for everyday phenomena. In one question, Al-Biruni asks Ibn Sina why, when a spherical glass bottle is filled with water, it can act like a burning lens. Ibn Sina's answer is that water is a viscous material of light colour, and according to him, this causes successive reflections of light within the water, which cause heating. This response demonstrates the gap which had opened up between natural philosophy and the more specialised knowledge of optics which existed by this time. To Ibn Sina, Al-Biruni responds simply, Where is the proof that reflections cause heating? Al-Biruni, far better versed in contemporary optics, followed up by pointing out that in the case of burning mirrors, the heating takes place not at the point of reflection, but at the point that the rays are concentrated. Indeed, Ibn Sina seems to have been almost completely ignorant of the field of optics, which had developed in ancient Greece and in the Islamic world. In a discussion on the nature of vision, he defended Aristotle's viewpoint, which by this time was grossly out of date. In the course of this correspondence, they also touched upon what was by now the most contentious idea in Aristotle's physics, his rejection of the vacuum. This was a key point of departure between the Aristotelians, who believed that all space was occupied by the four elements, and the atomists, who believed that space contained atoms surrounded by the vacuum. Al-Biruni never particularly endorsed atomism or any other system of natural philosophy, but he was nevertheless interested in exploring the argument. He asked Ibn Sina a clever question, which was, if we suck the air out of a bottle, then turn it upside down in water, why does it fill up? And as usual, Ibn Sina defends Aristotle's belief with an equally clever, if contrived, answer. He says that the suction did not create a vacuum as Al-Biruni had implied, but instead created heat through the forced motion of air. This heated air expanded and required more space, which pushed some of it outside. Then, when the bottle was placed in cold water, the air cooled and contracted, which allowed the water in. This answer may have satisfied Al-Biruni, but unfortunately, Ibn Sinner took the logic too far. He suggested that if you blow into the bottle instead of sucking, the same thing will happen, and the bottle will also fill with water. Likely, it never occurred to Ibn Sina that Al-Biruni would go and try this for himself, but perhaps inevitably, he did. In his own words, Furthermore, I performed the experiment, and the result was the opposite. No water entered into the bottle whatsoever. I broke many flasks trying this, enough to hold the water of the Amu River. Unfortunately, the tone of the discussion soon turned sour, with Ibn Sinner 
becoming exasperated at Alberuni's refusal to accept his answers, and by extension, the word of Aristotle. To one point he responded, Either you comprehended the saying of Aristotle in this matter, or you did not. If you did not, your belittling of someone who said something beyond your grasp is inappropriate. And if you did understand, your comprehension of the meaning should have prevented you from dragging in this quarrel. Alberuni seems to have responded in kind, and finally went too far when he called Aristotle the embellisher of his own infidelity. Eventually, Ibn Sina stopped responding to Alberuni's questions entirely, leaving his responses to his student, Al Masumi, who tried to calm the tone of the conversation, saying, It would have been more appropriate if you had used gentler language for your purposes. Al Biruni also gave up the correspondence at this point, perhaps concluding there was little more to be gained. Nevertheless, these letters are invaluable in demonstrating the debates on natural philosophy which were taking place at the turn of the new millennia. On one side, Ibn Sina belonged to a tradition that believed that the answers to the questions about the natural world could all be found in the works of Aristotle. Aristotle had himself thought that knowledge must first be derived from the senses, but never regarded it as necessary to test his conclusions. Naturally, this tradition had its shortcomings, but it did offer a complete and internally coherent system that could provide answers for most of the questions which were posed at the time. In the centuries that followed, Aristotelianism would come to dominate. However, we should be fair in judging Aristotle's followers. This was not a wholly static system which rejected all change. Even Ibn Sina recognised that the most egregious errors in Aristotle required correction. One of the most obvious was Aristotle's theory of motion, which states that a force was necessary to keep an object in motion. John Philoponus had already criticised Aristotle on this issue, and argued that an object will continue to move because of an impressed force, which the object acquired when it was thrown. This impressed force was gradually used up before the object fell to earth. Ibn Sina picked up on this idea from John, calling the impressed force mile. However, he argued that this mile was a property of all objects, and did not diminish naturally, but only when an object was subject to resisting forces. Ibn Sina also suggested that the amount of mile an object has is proportional to its mass, explaining why a stone will be thrown further than a feather. The theory of mile demonstrates how most Aristotelians, like Ibn Sina, were not completely dogmatic in their views. Instead, they sought to carefully weigh Aristotle's ideas against reason and other considerations. It may be best to think of this tradition as wishing to preserve Aristotle's natural philosophy, while also filling the gaps in its weakest parts. On the other hand, Alberuni was part of a very different tradition, one that was often at the periphery. His main predecessor was John Philoponus, whom he read extensively. And like John, Alberuni was willing to openly question the basis of Aristotle's philosophy. They didn't want to reform Aristotle's thought, but undermine it and tear down the whole facade. However, unlike John, he wasn't motivated by the search for religious truth, but rather a conception of truth based on a different way of knowing. Alberuni shared this with his contemporary Al Haytham, and the two of them would be responsible for the birth of a new methodology. Instead of resolving a point through argument, or relying on the word of an ancient philosopher, they sought to go out and test propositions for themselves. Their triumph was recognising that ultimately truth should derive from experiment. Although their work 
was a long way from our modern understanding of the scientific method. It was the start of something new. So I'd like to end the episode and the series on this note. I hope you've enjoyed this series on the Islamic Golden Age, which is a period which I still think is somewhat underexplored and underappreciated. Next time, however, we'll head back to Europe to explore what was happening there during this period. I hope you'll join us then.